For the ordinary worker in Singapore, life in the 1950s was a struggle. Thousands had no jobs, and those who had earned barely enough to feed the many mouths in their families. People were disenchanted with the British, who seemed unable to provide them with a better livelihood. This, together with lingering loyalties to former homelands, were a potent combination the communists took advantage of. China was emerging then as a strong nation, and the Chinese school students were very patriotic towards China. And the communists played on their patriotic emotions to draw them into their fold. The 50s also saw winds of change blowing across the British Empire. India, the most prized colony, had already won her independence in 1947. And the anti-colonial movement was gathering force in many other colonies. In Malaya, the murmur of nationalism had grown into a shout. Although resigned to the breakup of the empire, the British were anxious to prevent the communists from making any more gains in Singapore. In 1953, a commission was set up under Sir George Rendell. Its task was to look into how the people of Singapore could play a greater role in governing the country as a first step towards gradual self-rule. The Rendell Commission recommended a 32-seat legislative assembly, of which 25 were to be occupied by locally elected representatives. Although it meant that there would be more locals than British officials in the government, important posts like finance, internal security, defence, information services and the judiciary were to remain in British hands. Nevertheless, the release of the Rendell Commission report in February 1954 led to a flurry of political activity and the formation of new political parties. One of them, the People's Action Party, was an uneasy alliance of two opposing political camps. There was the non-communist group of English-educated return students led by a young lawyer, Lee Kuan Yew. And there was the pro-communist group led by men like Fong Sui Suan and Lim Chin Xiong. It was they who enjoyed the support of the Chinese educated students and the trade unions. We were very much conscious that we were fronting for them and the communists were very much aware that we, the narrow middle class, were dependent on them for mass support. That's quite true and we had to work together. There was no alternative. The communists by themselves had shown that with the emergency regulations, they could not win. And therefore, they have to work through an open front, not through subterfuge. The Singapore Labour Front, led by a well-known criminal lawyer, David Marshall, was another newly formed party. Both the Labour Front and the PAP wanted to see an immediate end to colonial rule. But members of the Progressive Party, the oldest party in Singapore, thought otherwise. We were advocating a gradual transfer of power spreading over a period of eight years. And at the end of that, consider whether we were in a position to ask for a complete transfer. We were aiming for independence. I think we were aiming in possibly a rather more conservative way than the other parties. We saw it reasonable to make one step at a time into something which was very important and uh, one had to be very responsible about, not to rock the boat, but to uh, take it in step, as I said, step by step. But it was the call for immediate self-rule that captured the people's attention. And no one did this more flamboyantly than David Marshall. Every day at lunchtime, I would be under what I call the old apple tree, and I'd hammer away at all oh, my entire uh, target was the cricket club. And <laughs> the cricket club would be lined with the members who rushed their meals in order to hear me uh, on the roof. And by the very vigor of the Straits Times, the Mlaer Tribune called me a monkey up a tree, wanting to pilot an aeroplane, mixing metaphors, right, left, and center. And I didn't scream about it a bit. In fact, I was delighted 
because I could see that by these attacks of the press they were making me known throughout the island. And they also built up the heat and the steam of that election, awakening our people uh, to the possibility of being critical, openly, brutally critical of the British uh, and, and, and telling them the truth to their face without fear of going to jail. Never before had there been such lively debate in Singapore. Issues like language and the lifting of emergency restrictions came to the fore. But the real crux of it all was the fight for self-government. A clash between the progressives and the labor front was inevitable. We considered that it was necessary to advocate an interim period because in our view, Singapore was then not in a position to take over full responsibility of government. Whether our people were ready or not, I don't understand that we're ready. They had a right to live their own lives according to their own genius, and I call that independence. As the campaigning drew to a close and polling day arrived, many expected the Progressive Party to win. It had, after all, fielded the most candidates, contesting for 18 of the 25 seats. But the Randall Constitution had brought about significant changes in the composition of the electorate. The Chinese educators, who were mainly from the lower income groups, now made up the bulk of the voters. It was a change that was to prove fatal for the Progressive Party. When the votes were counted, the progressives found that they had managed to secure only four seats. The basic problem was that the progressive party had this image of being conservative, pro-British and slow-moving. Moreover, I think it missed out the point of the change in the electoral system. It still concentrated on the middle class, English educated electorate rather than on the more important and significant mass base of the Chinese educated voters who were mainly the lower income groups. Whereas the other parties like PAP and Labour Fund went for the larger electorate of the Chinese educated left wing inclined voters. That strategy paid off. The PAP won three of the four seats they contested for. The Labour Front, much to their own surprise, won 10 seats. But the elation of winning did not last. Marshall soon found the British unwilling to accord him due recognition. To them, I really was a monkey up a tree and, 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 and uh, I remember the governor saying to me, don't rock the boat and uh, if, you, if you annoy the civil service, uh, your instructions will be like a glass of water in a uh, desert. Uh, it will disappear, leaving no race, trace behind. You've got to cooperate with the civil service. They were going to be my bosses, not me, their boss. Oh, no. Oh, no. Marshall's problem with the British was soon overshadowed by a more serious threat. The communists, who had been biding their time, were to unleash a series of strikes and riots that would severely test the new government. But despite the ensuing violence, the 1955 election gave the people of Singapore a foretaste of what it was like to run their own country. And that experience was to spur them on to fight for self-government and an end to 150 years of colonial rule.